Good morning. I'm excited to be back in St. Louis, not talking about uh, the old courthouse and that age of a building, but uh, fast forwarding 100 years to uh, mid-century modern. Um, <coughs> I'm looking to see, I have a, oh, let me move the mouse off, so I'm not adding that, that on, on projects. Um, excited to, to come to this uh, conference and I think a lot of um, what I have to present this morning really follows uh, well off of what we heard from uh, Gunny this morning because my talk really looks at some more case studies and some more questions. I think some of the same questions and uh, new questions and it's really uh, to look at and talk about these topics that um, we can discuss today and over the next several days, and we are continuing to discuss uh, in our work on um, mo mid-century modern structures. The examples of the work are uh, all mostly from the Michigan office of Quinn Evans, um, also looking at a little bit of the DC work, and it's, I'm gonna talk about how we discussed and approached the mid-century uh, modern problems <coughs> and what we grappled with in uh, working on these projects, and then to, to ask the questions for, for a discussion here in terms of what other people are looking at and wondering about and how they're solving um, their questions. I'm really looking sort of in three different areas that we've been um, working on. The first has to do with eligibility and documentation and understanding that where, what, where are we with the 50 year and exceptional, exceptional significance, our criteria G, and what are the considerations and questions that go along with that in mid-century modern structures. Next, uh, looking just a little bit about adaptability and uh, what does it mean to adapt the mid-century modern structures? What about them makes them easier or harder? Uh, to adapt, just looking at one small case study on that question. And then also looking at material assembly as well and what are the materials involved and the specific materials conservation uh, with the projects. So with that, I move forward. Down the slide. I'm paging down. Oh, she had me at the end of my pre my end and my first slide are the same. So the oh. here is a preview. <laughs> running backwards very quickly of what you're gonna see uh, to start. And there we go. Starting uh, with a look at Lafayette Park, which is in Detroit, Michigan. Uh, we were working with the Michigan Shippo. And this was in preparing a National Historic Landmark nomination. The nomination is uh, still in draft form, but um, the contexts here are um, looking at urban renewal, modern architecture planning, landscape design. Um, this project really the significant states on it we have is from 1956 to 1967, the involvement of Mies van, der, Mies van der Rohe, Herbert Greenwald as developer, Ludwig Hilbersheimer as planner, and Alfred Caldwell as the landscape architect to understand um, the importance of this as a landmark within uh, Detroit. Lots of the buildings here have already been, been listed individually. And I think it's really part of this is to try and understand um, the questions of the in integrity of the National Register and of our landmarking and to understand where do we separate what we might call truly historic with what is merely old and, and those questions. I think here is one that people are pretty clearly feel is truly historic, but also it's that question of, um, of what came before and what was lost in that. With the 
urban uh, renewal movement and with the areas that were just completely scraped clean? And is there a, a fabric or a history that we need to recognize, uh, think about or comment on here, the um, Black Bottom neighborhood thriving businesses that actually were what went away to build what we would say is a landmark today. Here's the images of it recently built. Uh, the site has, um, has the townhouses. It's very interesting in how the vehicular traffic is really kept to the edges of the site. Um, and then the overview, I think, gives you a better sense of the super block. It's really the super block concept that makes this so important with the integration of the landscape and the buildings, three towers and the townhouses uh, by Mies van der Rohe. And this new idea of really concentrating your housing so that you are also, you're gaining the park and the landscape with the concentrated housing on it. And just a couple more images uh, recently of how it is today. I also look at this as the last project in terms of a case study of materials and the work that we have uh, done on the towers at the building. But uh, towers, um, in some ways, similar to what we saw with Gunny with the, with the plaza, with the inside to outside curtain wall at that lobby, and, and how you deal with the glazing on the structures going up. Fiberglass Tower is uh, also known as Riverview. This was a project, is, a, is another urban redevelopment project in Toledo. Um, it's one that we have just recently, our firm is uh, nominated and it's, and it's on the National Register now. It's, uh, we determined it to be exceptionally significant locally. It was a, it's the only real urban renewal project that happened in downtown Toledo. Um, and it was all, it's the only part of a plan that was uh, developed by IM Pay that actually was completed here in terms of an urban renewal project. And then Harrison and Abramovitz from New York were the architects on the tower and the parking garage. This again, I think, is interesting because it's bringing in the urban landscapes and, and really thinking about the urban landscapes as part of the mid-century modern landscape with the plaza and the tower and the parking garage on here. This, the same team was sort of brought in to do this project who had just completed an Erie View project in Cleveland. So um, it was the same planning and, and architectural team building off of that. Here again, you see just the recognition of, of the fabric that was um, taken down and cleared. In this case, something was built, I think, it's maybe the history more in spots where actually the demolition from the uh, urban renewal program was done and the funds were never there to build that we may have lost more. Showing this as it um, recently opened, the uh, parking garage is on the left and then the tower on the right. It's fiberglass tower because it was done through um, Owens Corning fiberglass on that. And the um, the plaza has always been owned and maintained by the city, so it was a project with several owners in it as it was completed. And here's a view. I think this is also an interesting one to talk about and to think about how we, we determine th things significant or not and the impact of those, because this tower has been vacant for many years, and in part of it, it is that importance of the tax credits that will go in uh, and be used to make this a viable development project. That's something in the Detroit, Toledo area that we uh, look at and struggle with a lot on, is it just merely old or is it significant or in deeming it really significant with the tax credit dollars, does that then allow us to leverage those and actually redevelop a site and start to redevelop a part of the um, city that might otherwise not get redeveloped. And it's, um, it's those sort of pressures that we, we look at and talk about. So this is scheduled to um, hopefully start um, design work on residential at the top of the building and um, 
uh, office or residential down below. I don't know if that's been decided yet. It was originally all office. Um, next project is the FBI headquarters. I think this leads into some of the, the panel discussion later this afternoon of people thinking about uh, buildings and what buildings are uh, loved or not loved from the from this era. Um, I'd say the, the important things here on this is a project that we were brought in to look uh, at the determination of eligibility for this project with the, with the, for the GSA on it. And um, in the end, this was determined to not be eligible. It is a um, project that was uh, started in 67 and not completed till 75. So, you know, we are looking at the 50 year roll, we're looking at the uses of it where it was fairly obsolete when it, um, when the, when the building was built already with uh, physical file storage and fingerprinting and how it was set up that even by 75, the, the FBI and technology was changing so fast. So, so what kind of a floor plate do you have and what was the use? It is named after J. Edgar Hoover, which gives us a very prominent person. He did die before the completion of the building. And then it's also was really important as part of this planning for the Pennsylvania Advisory Council plan along Pennsylvania Avenue where it's located. This shows you the, the, the double block that it does occupy. Um, but throughout the process of this, uh, it really, the history really seems that it, it's truly a building by committee and committee and committee and, um, and I think there were some thoughts that really that so much was compromised from what was the original design and original part of the planning that was never realized in the project. Uh, I think it is one that's an uh, interesting case study because I think it brings up a lot of voices on both sides of the project. So here's the exterior and the interior courtyard view. Next, moving to a very, from a very big to a very small project. This is at Bald Mountain State uh, Recreation Area in Michigan, north of Detroit. Uh, Mid-century modern, modern Michigan. You can come and be a tourist in Michigan and you can go visit this at a, at a state park. This is just a small bathhouse, um, the lake, on a, on a lake that was commissioned by the state parks. It's designed by Gerner Burkerts and Associates. Uh, a very important name in mid-century modern architecture, a very important name in Michigan modern, inspired by the Mission 66, and this has been listed um, on the National Register. The question with this is really the idea of adaptability, and here we move from, we've determined it's eligible, but what and how can we use or reuse these buildings? When you come to the park, this is your contact station. This is where the person stay, is supposed to stay inside and then come out and get to the car, the wrong side of the car. And um, just in terms of, of, of running a park, and it, it has never worked well. But you can see what a whimsical and fun uh, structure it is. Once you get past this, another few miles down the road, you come to the actual bathhouse complex. It has two, two bathhouses that have the enclosed toilet room, open shower, changing room areas, and then there is a concession stand. The concessionaire worked. You'd walk up and order your hot dog, your popsicle, um, what you needed. So it's, it's just this fun design that in the 70s, everyone went to the beach and laid on the beach and slathered up and it was towel to towel. But as recreation uses have changed, they get very few visitors here a year. And um, the structures, while very interesting and unique in mid-century modern, they are out in a park and they are subjected to quite a bit of vandalism. I do think it's interesting that uh, the, the original drawings did call for brick, and this was an alternate on the drawings for the board formed concrete. I think if they're a brick, they might have crumbled sooner and, and, and not be here to be a question of how do you reuse as much for the, for the park. So this is one of the bathhouses. Um, here you see what you go in for a changing room. 
again, it's an it's a interesting architecture. It's a balance between what is the intent and the thought and the, and the fun design versus the practicality of getting yourself between these little concrete walls. There's another little concrete stool to, to use to change within these, these cubbies. It's just not a, not a friendly design for people. So it's thinking about how we find a new use. You know, a building is something that's used. We need to find something here. How can we make this work? It's not, not out on this park in Michigan. It's going to be hard to, to have it stay as, as a, a jewel of, of design um, with no use for it. And then there's, I think, the question on this one, the reversibility and adaptations to, to modern concrete structures. Um, is this is the concession stand and in our feasibility study for reuse we looked at perhaps this could be a really nice picnic pavilion that would involve this is the view from the plaza to the lake you don't really see the lake and people never went in this building but um, how much of the walls do we take down and still retain the integrity of the building is a question and the, the integrity of the design so that's uh, one of the big questions, I think, in here was the thought of really needing to open places up, sight lines, make things feel safe, but how much do you, do you take away to keep what's there? You can see the vandalism, all the copper roofs have been, have been stripped, not by us on that ladder, but by vandals in the past. Um, again, here, talking about how you use or adapt or safety, you can see um, many of you know Eileen Tyler. She's walking there into the into the um, restroom, and it's it's. If it was busy, it might not be a scary place. If it's not busy, it can be, and it's those questions of of how do you adapt or not. And, and I think the other thing to keep in mind is when you can go back to the original work. This is the original um, plan for it, and look at the buildings as we go through and we adapt and we look at um, mid-century modern is really to understand the holistic design that so many of these buildings, it's the building, it's the site, it's the interior, it's the lighting, it's the furnitures. And um, so it's not just the structure, but how do we look at all those elements? Uh, here's some photos from the site and, and what of those are important and how do we keep them or not? Um, you know, the desks, the integrated light fixtures, the pie-shaped toilet stalls, maybe not, that are concrete. But, it, you know, it's, a, it's, a, it's a, it was an exciting, small but interesting problem on, on what to do and make this viable. Um, next, looking at the McGregor Center, which is in Michigan. This is sort of going more to the materials and how we, what are the questions with with the materials. This is at Wayne State University. Uh, it's the reflecting pools and site restoration that we were involved in. Uh, you can come to Docomomo. We're very proud it's going to get an award there um, at it. This is a, a historic photo. And I think here the important thing is to understand it's a black and white photo, but to understand the black and white of it, the black of the reflecting pool and the white of those islands and walkways that was really an important part of the original design. Uh, when we got there on the project, this is what it had looked like. The pools had um, always leaked. This is the Yamasaki project. I forgot to know, for those who don't know, it is very important. Um, we are working on a national uh, landmark, the, on landmarking this uh, building and the site. It was important. Um, as an early, one of his first reflecting pool designs that he went on to do more, more work on. But, the, but it, had, it had leaked often. Those beautiful white islands were a chipped marble that everyone kicked into the pools that gummed up the works even more. But it's that clean look with those rustic boulders that were picked and selected. More and more of our work involves laser scanning the projects before we start to really understand. It helps us understand problems and it understands how to um, document where things get put back. Part of the impetus on this scan was those boulders and we want things to go back where they were, how they were placed uh, by Yamasaki when the, when the project was um, initially 
created. Uh, what we found out, though, was as we started the project, the, um, the concrete of the pools was, it just dissolved. It just was not a material, it was not a material that we could keep and restore. And so then the forethought of this laser can was very important because this project was a complete recreation of the, of the pools. So it's there looking at, is it the, the concrete of the pools that's important or is it the intent and the design intent of the project? And in this project, it was really the design intent that we, we felt was the most important to bring back. And um, so much of this is a complete recreation, but it's going back to the white look. This time the marble chips are adhered into the pavers so that, that it should stay um, and function well. It's going back to the black look of the pools and the reflecting and really making this a very wonderful, um, serene space to, to be in and, and enjoy. It's just a wonderful spot on the campus if anyone's in Detroit. And then finally, a uh, look at Lafayette Towers. We started looking at the um, Lafayette Park here, uh, the building owner asked us to look at the plaza restoration, window restoration. We also did a complete MEP replacement in these buildings. They're the two towers with the parking garage between on Lafayette Park, um, a later Mies project where I think he'd, he'd worked out a lot of the details from his earlier projects into how to execute them here. It brings up into the materials and that looking at the aluminum and what kind of mock-ups are we going to do to try and understand how to uh, clean, in this case, the aluminum and, and just the different options you're studying and testing to try and understand what works best on these mid-century modern structures. And then it was also a question of the windows and doing an energy replacement you're asked to look at the windows and shouldn't you replace the windows and what can happen. Uh, in, in this case, we, we deemed that it really wasn't, to keep the look, it wasn't really possible to replace the windows and the windows were not that, that bad a condition. It did involve abating around every window where, where we had to abate and resealing every window but keeping the original fabric on these buildings. Um, we have to do. And then the very last item on this uh, project in my presentation is looking at the plaza. And this, I think, is a plaza where it's sort of the opposite take of um, Yamasaki's reflecting pools. And here it was looking at not the design intent, the aesthetic intent of the plaza, but looking at what is the functional intent of this plaza. This was a plaza meant for people to be able to come and gather and um, recreate and have the pool here. Uh, and in the, the, the plaza was leaking. The, you saw other pictures of concrete spalling onto cars below. And, and the, so it was a complete replacement of the plaza and the plaza system. And in here, um, there were a lot of discussions and it was really decided that it was the intent of the plaza as a place to gather and that it would be redone with, with the pool and with some of the significant features, but, but rebuilt very differently with a lot more green space and different areas to try and give um, people what they want to use today to come and enliven the space and, and uh, gather how people do today, not in the past. So this is a hard to see um, plan, but a lot more of the green roof in it, looking at where we could um, put in curbs to signify and have ghosts of what the original had been but really it's bringing back a lot more green space and uh, opportunities for some other activities that they don't have on the plan. With 30 seconds, I think I made it through. I would welcome any questions.